I want to especially welcome Dr. Lisa Kimball. Um, Lisa Kimball is not only a dear friend of mine, but also a former Virginia Seminary colleague. She is the Associate Dean of Lifelong Learning and the James Maxwell Professor of Lifelong Christian Formation at Virginia Theological Seminary. She brings to us her expertise in human development, experiential learning, faith formation, church history, lay ministry development, and much more. She is a complete uh, underfunctioning person. <laughs> But she's also very dear to me and to many people because not only does she know a lot about formation and faith development, but she's actively engaged in it in her own life. To know Lisa is to be inspired to know God better. And I think that's a fabulous and inspiring thing all in its own. So Lisa, I want to welcome you to speak to us. Thank you. So there's one awkward thing. I don't know if you have to get your green cards out, but I have a white tag, so I'm supposed to not speak. <laughs> so I, I'm asking for dip, dispensation. So, okay. And I believe I'm supposed to speak for 15 minutes, so I'm going to set my little clock so that I can pay attention to that, except that I put it for five, which is... Okay, okay, good. Um, it is really an honor to be here, and... I am um, particularly <clears throat> thrilled as just being here for a few hours to hear the health and vitality in this diocese. And I realize that conventions are the place that we want to tell those stories, but I sense transparency, I, tr I sense honesty about the places where you may feel more vulnerable or where things have not been easy. And um, as a visitor, I just want to tell you I am honored to be here and to recognize God at work in your midst. I pray that the words I share with you will build on that, not compete with that. So let's get started. Oh, sorry, back up a little. There we go. Um, it's always interesting to know a little bit about who you're talking, who's talking and, and where I come from. Um, this is a quick collage of my really kind of current life. Uh, I am a diehard Nationals fan, so it was a pretty good World Series. Um, Rather late in life, um, I've moved from being a serious backpacker to an RVer, and uh, that is the Yellow Lab who accompanies us on all of our RV trips. The picture in the middle is my spouse, Trisha Lyons, otherwise known as the Hogwarts chaplain, um, and an author and scholar and theologian in her own right, and really a wonderful human being. And then um, I want to say a little bit now about my own experience as a person who attempts to live um, faithfully committed to the formation of other people. It's not always glamorous work. Those of you who are clergy and lay leaders with pastoral and formation ministries, it's not easy walking with other people in faith. It's not easy being there when they most need us. Um, in fact, there are plenty of times when living fully into my own baptismal promises and especially that one that we say so easily, but it is so hard to love my neighbor as myself, respecting the dignity of every human being, not just people like me, not just people I agree with, not just people I like, not just people I think are cute, not just people I think are smart or curious, but everyone. Um, sometimes those people in my life and maybe in yours can actually be annoying Sometimes those people can be demanding. Sometimes those people are in our families. Sometimes they certainly can be inconvenient. Um, and sometimes it can be dangerous. I've already been sitting and listening to the stories of ministry in El Salvador and the witness and the courage to go out into gang-infested communities to bring medicine and health to communities. Witnessing to the love of neighbor is not always easy, and it is not always convenient. And I share that because the woman directly below me in the center of this opening slide is my goddaughter, Jane. And I could talk for the whole time I'm here about my relationship with Jane. But to the simple version of it is that I'm a member of a downtown church in Washington, DC. The other picture to her left and underneath my upward arms is a congregational group of us um, at one of the marches in DC. 
But I met Jane because she came to our feeding program, which we have every Sunday morning. We feed 200 people a hot breakfast every Sunday. And she came as a 17-year-old um, who was hungry. And she came with her boyfriend. And we began to have a conversation that morning. I invited her to join me for worship, which is before breakfast. Very few of our guests who just come to eat really want to worship, but she sat with me and was curious and sort of followed along the Episcopal calisthenics that we've been doing, right? The up, down, the down. And she was very, very open to it. And that morning we happened to reaffirm our baptismal covenant. And at some point in the conversation, I think probably during the piece, she said, I've never been baptized. And so began our relationship. My offering to walk with her toward the font and my being willing to learn with her about the life she was living. And Jane has had a life very different from mine. There is no threshold that we have not had to negotiate between class and race, physical ability, um, education. She came into my life with barely a second grade education. Uh, she had lost so many things that were dear to her and had so little stability. But in her heart and in her courage is resilience like none other. So fast forward, she is now living in an apartment. She is qualified for disability. She's graduated from high school. She is in college. She is extraordinary. And she sends me a text every day to tell me that I am loved and to ask me something important that's going on in life. So I say that because we are partners in this journey of faith. We are partners in formation. And one of the things she has taught me above all else is how to rest. She's always asking me, why are you working so hard? Have you spent time with your wife? Have you gone for a walk with the dog? She's not demanding. She's concerned. And her love for me is a reminder to us about the importance of that discipline of rest and that partnership that is discipleship. So the good news is that we have relationships that teach us about faith. The bad news is that the slides don't want to forward, but they will. They will come in their own due time. There we go. Um, we have all heard and are probably way too familiar with the rhetoric of decline across the North American church. The reasons for what some people would describe as the precipitous decline of once mainline, formerly mainline Protestant churches, um, and for the significant demographic changes that we all see, are often contested. And that can be a conversation we can have another time. But what there is no doubt about is that many of us in our local experience of church have experienced and often do experience some of the consequences of all of that. We are seeing fewer people in our communities. We are older in our congregation. We have a lower birth rate. There are things happening that are real, that we know. Some of you may also know the powerful language of the Canadian philosopher, Charles Taylor, that he introduced actually just over 10 years ago now in a book that he wrote called The Secular Age. It's language that I think speaks really well to us across the church and personally. He introduces this language of enchanted and disenchanted, not original to him, but he develops it in a very contemporary landscape. He describes for us how institutions have always told stories, how they have always brought to us narratives that helped us navigate human identity and community. And what he says in this is that we've always had competing narratives before the 20th century. We knew that the Native American story about what it meant to be a person of this land was very different from an immigrant story of being a person of this land. The issue wasn't that there was one narrative. The issue was that there were many narratives, but we were in the responsible place as human beings of discerning among them to choose narratives that were life-giving and hope-building. What he then goes on to describe in great detail, it's not a thin book, it's a thick book, um, is how Americans used to believe the stories that institutions told them. And those institutions were telling stories of hope, of mystery, of divine intervention, of enchantment, of something greater than themselves that gave life meaning and purpose. 
And we always, always had something to hope for that we gathered around in ritual and practice, particularly as church. But what he suggests, and I concur, is that in the 20th century, there has been an incredible shift that we're now living in the 21st century of disenchantment, that we have become people who are skeptical and disenchanted about the narratives that we have been given. We have never stopped wanting a narrative. We've never stopped needing narratives. We've never stopped trying to weave narratives. But what Taylor claims is that it's not the narratives that themselves have collapsed. What's collapsed is the credibility of the institutions that are carrying them. The credibility of our government structures, the credibility of our educational structures, the credibility of labor unions, perhaps even the credibility of the church. The stories that they were telling in the late 20th century did not match the lived experience of many people. And so there is a distancing from everyday life and the stories that we were being given. And people began to distrust, distrust the institution, distrust the groups that affiliate with the institution, and began to have to weave stories of their own. We make meaning through stories. We build narratives. We need lives of purpose. But where once they were formed in relationship, in relationship to sturdy, trusted meta-narratives that we inherited from earlier generations, today what is happening in so much of this country is that individuals are constructing their narrative, their meaning, their sense of purpose through trial and error, through consumption, through competition, through external value systems that tell them whether they are worthy or not. Why? Because the storytellers who represent those institutions and carry the established narratives are perceived as corrupt. The consumption, the, the competition is so painful that people are pulling from it and looking for alternatives. Is it any wonder that we are existentially tired? I live in Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway. I know something about people existentially tired. It happens in the grocery store. People look at each other and look, there is just this fatigue that comes across their face. Don't talk to me about politics. Don't mention what's happening across the river. Don't go there. But the alternative, the space that's left, is very superficial. So too often, I think, as church, we can become anxious. We can become even manic, trying to rescue the things that we cannot control, and consequently, sometimes, neglect the very things we can. In this climate of competing goods, in this climate of not knowing what we believe, we sometimes go down to the very nitty gritty of church and we fight over the wrong things. I cannot tell you how many times I visit a congregation on Sunday and the rector apologizes to me for the small number of people attending the eight o'clock service. Do you know how fabulous it is to have three or four or five faithful people who gather ever but on a Sunday morning to worship together at Eucharist? Do you know what a clergy person or lay leader can do to walk with four or five people deeply in relationship to God and scripture and tradition? But instead, because we had a narrative that included scale and, and greatness, we see ourselves as diminished and frail. Instead of seeing that all five people could fit in most cars and go have coffee together right after the service or have ice cream on a Sunday afternoon, we're apologetic, we feel less than. Half of all the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis are screw tape convincing the devil to the patient of, to focus, even to pray, about the things that he cannot control, to distract him from the things that he can. That habit fosters depression, darkness, despair, fear. It obscures love. When we are afraid, it is impossible to love well. In fear, we cannot imagine freedom. In fear, we become reactive, and our commitment to Christian formation and discipleship becomes programmatic. It becomes episodic, and it's often shallow. One-off events, one program, one, and then with big gaps, and then one more little opportunity. 
but we don't think through how do we build an environment where all of us are regularly being formed and regularly reflecting on what God is doing in our lives and regularly noticing the things that touch us in worship and telling someone else. The more the demands of daily life and the chaos of the public square press in on us, the more tempting it can be to become reactive and to choose a seemingly safe and familiar but shallow way forward. To be really clear, I am not coming here to accuse you or me of being particularly cynical or particularly skeptical or even particularly shallow. What I am concerned about is that we can go there without even knowing we're going there. And look at Peter in the Bible. How many times was he afraid when Jesus appeared to him? How many times was a man as faithful as Peter unable to see what he needed in the way of love before him? It is critical to us that we recognize that the forces that are pushing many of us to that place of fatigue, to that place of fear, are real. There, are re there really are forces that are bringing us to places of shallow practice, to places where we are legitimately anxious. The global culture that clearly rewards us for posting and proclaiming. A digital world that is ironing us flatter and flatter. Hyperconnectivity, as wonderful and powerful as it is, also pumps news and information into our lives 24-7. Fake news, real news, all news, there's always the sense that we're behind. <clears throat> the temptation to multitask, which now we know from the psychologists is actually not a possibility, but the temptation to be busy and the ostensible reward structures for being busy. And of course, in your local worship settings, in your congregations and in your ministries, a very legitimate awareness that there are resource constraints and there may be mounting expectations for sustainability and for success. In my opinion, the challenge facing our church is not a lack of depth. It is not that we are people who are not hopeful at our core, but it is a reluctance to live into the practices we preach. There is little wisdom in the language of decline. There is little wisdom in us being afraid. We do not have a declining church, in my opinion. We have a lack of depth church, a lack of depth crisis. I've come to believe that the greatest threat in Christianity today, in America, in fact, in the 21st century, is not atheism, it's not pluralism, it's not politicization, it's not the nuns, the people who were never with us as Christians. It's not the duns, the people who were and have walked. It's not even sex abuse scandals and hypocrisy, as painful and awful and devastating as they can be. The greatest existential threat to us as Christians is superficiality. And as my colleague and New Testament professor Kathy Grieb reminds her students every year, Christianity is just one generation away <clears throat> from extinction. It has never been a birthright. It has never been a genetic inheritance. It has always been something that we have to form. Christians are made and not born, as the second century Christian apologist Tertullian once said. We need to know that we are on a journey that is lifelong and we are ever more becoming more fully who God intends us to be as the child created in God's image. That is not an easy journey, and we need each other to live this well. But it is a journey, and it is something we are on now, and we will be on until we die. So one of my heroes, in 1991, the DC public school teacher and lay leader and biblical scholar and lifelong Christian educator, Verna Dozier. She said to us all, we have all failed the dream of God. The terribly patient God still waits. God is merciful, God is gracious, and God is waiting for us. Going deep is hard, 
Going against the dominant culture is not easy. We were never baptized to be part of the empire. We were baptized to become new, to be born again in Jesus Christ. And we need each other. And this is where a rule of life, a rule rooted in love, comes in. It is an antidote to our times. It is a radical roadmap that takes us and forms identities in every one of us that are distinctive, Eucharistic, and love-shaped for a world that desperately, desperately needs love. We have been invited by an incredibly dynamic man who will be with you next year, whose faith is so palpable and transparent and is awakening a sense of hope and transformation across the globe to walk the way of love. And I was privileged to be part of the writing team that was locked up for a weekend at Virginia Seminary to come to some kind of definition about what this rule of life would be. And here's the irony. Great people, locked in a room, two and a half days, came up with this idea based on the catechumenate, the ancient practice of the church to make Christians. How would we invite people to seek? There's little cards on your table. What do you seek to enter into this rhythm of life that we wanted to be a rule? We came up with practices that were absolutely ancient and could be lived in the 21st century. And we came up with six amazing practices. And we missed rest. And the one who pointed that out to us was our presiding bishop, who said, this is great work. And you have forgotten the seventh day. <laughs> so um, the way of love is brought to you um, as a model. And then we will talk more about those practices as they relate to your proposed way of love in the Diocese of Central New York tomorrow. But in order to do that, I think we need your lives and the practices that are already happening in your lives and how God is already blowing through your lives to be in this room. So what I need you to do is take out a device, if you have one, on which you could list numbers 1 through 20. So a notepad on your phone or your iPad or a piece of paper. It could be a tiny margin on one of the outlines, one of the agenda pages for this event. Everyone needs something to write on, digitally or physically, and something to write with, your finger, your stylus, or a pen you can borrow from your neighbor. And all you need to do is go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way down to 20. And I'm going to give you a quiz. And here's the challenge. All the questions are yes, no. And once you've answered them, you must not lose the answers, because this is all about tomorrow. Number one. Were you baptized as an infant? Number two, are you a cradle Episcopalian? Number three, have you ever had a speeding ticket? That's hopeful. Number four, are, which one? That's right. Number four, are you comfortable with silence? Number five, can you remember the family Bible? Can you remember the family Bible? Number six, was that Bible read as in R-E-A-D? Was it read out loud, read by someone? Number seven, have you been on a pilgrimage? Number eight, do you listen to podcasts? Number nine, are you ever lonely? Ten, did you go to summer camp as a young person or an adult? Number 11, do you have a spiritual mentor? Number 12, 
Is your extended family multiracial? Thirteen, do you know someone personally who has been affected by the opioid crisis? Fourteen, do you have a hobby? Fifteen, do people in your congregation or faith community talk about vocation and calling? Number 16, do you tweet? 17, have you witnessed a miracle? 18, do you know someone over 100? What was that? Living or dead, is that what you said? Have you known someone well who lived over to beyond 100? Number 19, are you a godparent? 20, have you ever imagined yourself or longed to be a specific superhero? (laughs) Now, you've written your answers, save them. Save them. I need you to have them tomorrow. So save them. Put them somewhere where they will not get lost. These seven practices of the way of love that the presiding bishop and his team developed are turn, learn, pray, worship, bless, go, and rest. All of those practices show up in the Eucharist that we are living together here today and tomorrow. When we turn, we come to God and give God our attention. We gather. When we learn, we learn together in community. We learn by hearing and reading and digesting scripture. We pray. We worship with our bodies, with our voices. We worship with the practices that we have inherited as the people of God in the Episcopal Church. When we bless, we bless one another with our presence, with our listening, with our noticing, with our calling people by name, with our recognizing people on the margins, by welcoming all to the table. And when we have been fed, We go, we go out into the world carrying the good news of Jesus Christ, the promise of forgiveness and being loved. And when we go and bear that good news from the Eucharist out into the world, the love that people experience allows them to breathe and to understand that they too are loved and to rest in the hands of God. And tomorrow, we will look at those practices in light of those questions, and you will realize that you too are turning, learning, praying, worshiping, blessing, going, and I pray, resting. That is one of my favorite hymns. And I didn't even pick it. What a morning we have already had. I am deeply moved, if not overwhelmed, by what I've experienced. Um, I have this sense that we are truly being the church at worship, that we are hearing stories and sharing stories and noticing God and celebrating new communities. And wow. It's pretty incredible. So let's keep it up, folks. Um, Let's just keep doing this. It's, It's holy work. It is so good, so good. 
So I apologize for being behind this thing, but I have all this paper I'm sorting out. So um, consider me right up in front, right with you. The first thing we need to do is be sure that you have all found your answers to the quiz. So be sure they are accessible to you. Your little bit of paper, your phone, your laptop, your iPad, your tablet, the back of your hand that I hope you didn't wash. Whatever it is you wrote those things on, just have them available. That's very important. <clears throat> and let's review just quickly what this thing called the way of love is. The way of love, as we are now living it in the Episcopal Church, is an amazing experience of opportunity to grow more fully into who God called us to be. People who are growing in these seven Christian practices, turn, learn, pray, worship, bless, go, rest, are people who are constantly growing in the context of Christian community. They are people who are rooted in community and then living out their faith in the world. The way of love is not an individual improvement plan. It is not your New Year's resolution to start going to the gym. It's not the thing to make you feel not good at being human. It is quite the opposite. They are these practices anchored in our ancient Christian tradition that can only strengthen our resolve to live fully and wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, whole self. So I mentioned yesterday that they come from the catechumenate, the church's oldest discipleship process that prepared adults for baptism in the early church. In the catechumenate, over the years, over the centuries, we've established four stages of natural growth, natural progression, from the very earliest inquiry, that lovely phrase in the gospel today about Zacchaeus wanted to see what, who Jesus was, wanted to, not to see him with just his eyes, he wanted to know what this dude was all about, right? He wanted to know, that's hunger, that's seeking, that's wondering. So the catechumenate itself begins with a sense of inquiry, and then it goes into with a marked moment in the congregation that says, we see this person who's asking really good questions, and we want to bless their journey, and that person's willing to stand up and say, I'm here, and I'm curious, and I have lots of questions, and we pray over them. And then they move into the second stage, which is a stage of deep and serious inquiry where they are mentored and companioned by other Christians, where they participate in our traditions of worship and prayer and Bible study, and they begin to get real answers in their lives to those deep questions. And then when some are ready at the time that God appoints, they say, I want to go even further toward baptism. I want to go even further to reaffirm this relationship I'm beginning to grow with God in Jesus Christ. And we pray over them again, and we say, this is amazing, and you are making us, the body of Christ, richer. And that person then commits themselves in the traditional catechumenate to a period of intense preparation. In the traditional catechumenate, that was often during Lent and into Holy Week, when they would fast, they would study even more scripture, they would work really hard on the core traditions and values of our faith. And then they would be ready, if God so called and they felt responsive, to be baptized, to actually go through a rite of initiation into the body of Christ. And typically in the traditional catechumenate, that was at the Easter vigil, that magnificent service in which we tell the story of the people of God from creation to resurrection. These people who have come to us because they're curious and want to see Jesus, are ready to die with us to rise again and be made new. And then, in the traditional catechumenate, we move out from baptism, from initiation, into this radical way of living with Jesus, this radical thing called baptismal life. 
and we become Christians in the world, in Christian community, who are then mentoring and supporting and loving other people to companion with us in their journey of faith. Sadly, in the church, even when we practice the catechumenate today, we kind of trail off sometimes after baptism, after confirmation, right? We do the thing really well, and then people will say to me in a very poignant way, nothing's really changed. I'm just on more committees. I'm just busier. I'm, you know, I thought when I said yes to God and was baptized or I affirmed my faith at confirmation that, that something really would be different. And too often it's not. That's really, really failure on our part. The practices of the way of love, as I said yesterday, are ways that each of us and we together can move from gathered worship out into the world and back to gathered worship, confident that we are in fact changed, that we are in fact committing ourselves to love our neighbor, to love God, and to love ourselves in ways that are so radically different than the extremism in our world, or the political authoritarianism in our world, or the forms of oppression that are crushing people's freedom in our world. We are made new in baptism, and we are made new every time we gather for Eucharist. And we need to live in the world as if that is true. And when we do, our lives are changed, and those who know us and experience us experience a love they cannot find anywhere else. So I am going to play now with these ways of being Christian in the world that are both ancient and modern, postmodern, and whatever is to come, and claim that we together can live rules of life that truly equip us to be radical agents of love in the world. When we do this, it is something that we absolutely together grow and find new life in places where we thought we had died. That's the arc of Holy Week. Our congregations may be small in number, but they can be mighty in soul and mighty in spirit. And they can change, they can move mountains through faith and commitment to love. So this isn't just about us individually. This isn't just about us as a little church. This is about us as the body of Christ. So are you ready? OK, let's get back to those questions. If you said yes to number four, please, if you are able, stand up and or wave your hands yes to number four. And now, be very quiet, very quiet, very quiet. We are the people who are comfortable with silence. The people who are standing or waving are people who are comfortable with silence. Please sit. Why is that so important? Because in silence, we turn again to God. In silence, we still our mind, we still our anxiousness, and we can hear the still, small voice of God. The silence in our lives is a space in which God can awaken us to all that is possible in our being. And silence, as many of us know, is a rare commodity today. It is very hard to be somewhere in the world in North America where it is actually, literally silent. Even if we all stopped rustling paper and moving our cups and sat still, I can hear the air vent system. But you start to notice new things, right? So we are turned toward God all of the time in our lives in ways we don't necessarily notice. And what's so wonderful about the way of love and choosing to commit ourselves to intentional Christian practices is that things that may seem kind of ordinary, like pauses, 
and silence become profound disciplines of practice. Not to be afraid of silence in North America is a holy gift. You may be able to model that at work, in a corporate or environment, in an engineering office, somewhere where things are busy and urgent and rushed, just pausing for a moment before you speak, or pausing to let someone else speak who might not have spoken. Then, per, then that very gift of stillness, of silence, that turned you to notice God and neighbor could also then turn you to be practicing blessing by witnessing the love toward neighbor that you can give in silence. OK, how about if you said yes to number 17? Please stand or wave or get big. Wow, look around the room. Look how many people are standing, and I'm standing with you. We have witnessed a miracle. Do you realize how un-Episcopalian that is? <laughs> Seriously, look at you all. You have seen God at work in miraculous ways, and maybe more than once. So now I'm going to do something very brave. Stay standing or waving. Put your hand up if, having witnessed a miracle, you have shared that experience with other people. OK, look again. This is testimony. This is what it means to be a person of love who believes God acts in the world in real time. We have stories to tell. We have stories to share about how God has healed or transformed or made new or redeemed us or brought us from the darkness, or taken us from the margins, created opportunities for people around us to know love and know life. Share that. Thank you. Anybody who said, here, listen carefully, yes to number five and yes to number six. Yes to five and yes to six, please stand. So folks, this does not surprise me at all, and I confess I am sitting. <laughs> These are the few blessed ones among us who can remember the family Bible, and the family Bible was read, as in R-E-A-D. The Episcopal Church has a biblical literacy crisis. Most of us did not grow up in congregations or homes where the Bible was part of our daily fluency. Your bishop isn't standing. We have to make up for some lost time. And the people standing among us may be mentors to us in that process, among others of us who have taken time to study scripture, dwell in the word, and begin to not be afraid of that book that in my family was on the coffee table, and I used it a lot to press flowers. It was a beautiful, heavy Bible, and wax paper, wax paper, pretty flower in about the epistles was a great spot to create a lovely pressed flower arrangement. So please do sit. The Bible is a really interesting, I think, um, bellwether of, of the health of our faith communities. If you know about the Willow Creek community outside Chicago, a non-denominational evangelical um, megachurch, for lack of better language, that was started by a pastor called Bill Hybels. Huge campus, right? Bigger building and facility and parking lot than most junior colleges. Enormous, remarkable space. Bill retired from that work of being the founding pastor. They called a new pastor. And as is unfortunately often the case in leadership transitions that are distinctive, the, the pastor who was called had a very difficult time connecting and, and building momentum on the foundation that had been laid. So the elders, the, the lay leaders and other pastors of that congregation made a hard decision. They invited the new pastor to leave and they called Bill Hybels back the founding pastor, and asked him to return. 
Bill had been on his own pilgrimage. He had been out in the world preaching and writing and teaching and learning. And he came back as a sense of call, but he came back as a changed person. He started to notice things at this very successful megachurch that he hadn't noticed when he had been the founding senior pastor. He noticed that as much as they had thousands of people engaging with them in daily programs and Sunday worship, what he was concerned about was they had just about as many people coming in the front door, the inquirers, as they had leaving out the back door. And Bill faithfully said, we're not doing something right. If we were feeding the spiritual lives of all of our engaged members, they wouldn't be sneaking out the back door. So he bravely committed to a major research study in his own congregation. It happens the research sociologist he hired was an Episcopalian. That's just a little side bit of trivia. But the research scholar that came in designed a full multi-mixed method study that included surveying everybody that was involved with Willow Creek, interviews with significant numbers of people, lots of observation, and they put together some results. And it's well worth looking into those deeper results. But the really high level findings that are affecting all of us today is that from Willow Creek, a church that is Bible-based, has a biblical preaching every Sunday. What they learned about why people were leaving, particularly long-term members, is really telling. People were starved for more of a relationship with scripture. They wanted a closer relationship with God than they were experiencing in the activity of church. And the study found that the busier people were at church had nothing to do with the depth of their faith. That the busier people were, the more likely they were to be burned out or just traveling along spiritually in kind of a status quo place. The people who were growing were people who were less busy and more deeply engaged in Bible study and other forms of, of scripture reflection. What Willow Creek had to learn is that me as the pastor telling you as the congregant Here's the text, and here's how we interpret it, and now you've learned about the Bible, was not what people wanted. What people wanted was to engage with the text, the living word of God, and to reflect on it in their own lived experience, like dwelling in the word. So fast forward, that study has now been adapted by other denominations, including the Episcopal Church. We know it as Renewal Works, and surveys are now available that we can take to measure our spiritual vitality. And when you take it as an Episcopal church, you will discover many of these same findings, that you are, as a congregation, perhaps less spiritually vital than you thought you were, because it's not just whether people like church, it's not just how many people are in your coffee hour, it's not just you know, what we do programmatically, it's much deeper than that. Are we forming disciples who are growing in confidence about their relationship with God through Jesus Christ? So Verna Dozier, my hero, I introduced you to last night, she also says, and this is a good caution, what we have done is make an idol of the Bible to make it the fourth person of the Trinity. We have made an idol of the Bible to make it the fourth person of the Trinity. What I have learned from the Willow Creek study, from renewal works, and from my own practice is that engaging with scripture is not an intellectual enterprise alone. It requires my whole self. It's not this thing on the coffee table that I can't touch until I am so theologically trained that I can understand it all. It's an invitation passed on to us over the centuries to engage in a creative and loving and generous God. And we need to find ways to do that personally and corporately. If you said yes to number eight, please stand or wave your arms. Everybody, you get major, major points. You listen to podcasts. Can you shout out a couple of your favorites? The Adventure Zone. The Adventure Zone. Which one? 
Blazing Genius, what was the genius one? There you go, Raising Genius. Which one? On Being, Way of Love, it has a podcast. Fresh Air. Basically, if you are, please sit down, thank you. If you are a person who is curious about the world and wants to learn, we're into learn, Bible is about learning, right? And listening to other wise people about crazy ideas or foundational um, thought is something available to us now 24-7. Almost every radio show, TV show, um, author has a podcast. Institutions have podcasts. You may be typing, you may be recording your sermons at your congregation and posting them on your website or perhaps pushing them out through social media. That's a form of podcast. The idea that we can learn to grow as people with body, mind, and spirit when we are in motion, in transit, in our bed, whenever we are ready to listen is an incredible gift. Learn in the way of love is defined as reflect on scripture each day, especially on Jesus' life and teachings. So find those podcasts that you're drawn to that can teach you about the love of God. How about anybody who said no to number 15? I appreciate your honesty. And these are people, and this would be true for me too, sadly, we are the people for whom the, our congregations do not regularly talk about vocation and calling. Those are not words we hear at coffee hour, or they're not words we hear in the hallway, or perhaps from a sermon. Thank you, please sit down. Coming to understand one's Christian vocation, I believe, is the fruit of the practice of discernment. And too often, the only places that we hear the language of call or vocation is in the ordination process. And it should be there. That's a very good place for us to focus on discernment. But there are lay vocations that all of us occupy all of the time. And it's really important that as a church, we find ways to celebrate and honor the spiritual gifts that each of us has been given and is sending us out into the world to live and use. So there's a problem when the church becomes the primary focus of lay ministry. When we have, and this is what Willow Creek discovered, people who were alive and loved God and wanted to serve God faithfully were scooped up by the busy work of church. And a lot of what they did was on the plantation that is the Willow Creek campus. What if your call is to go to villages in El Salvador and bring health to people who would not otherwise have it? What if your call is to talk to your shut-in neighbors who are not otherwise seeing people in their homes? What if your call is to be a person who witnesses to love in that anxious office I was describing? What if your call is to be a math tutor after school to someone in your neighborhood whose family has a lower formal education level and whose parents are intimidated because they can't help their kids study math? Those vocations matter. What if your vocation is to be a mom or an aunt or a godmother? What if your vocation is to fix bicycles so that we don't just fill our trash heaps with good and perfectly reusable bikes. What are your vocations? What are your callings that are part of your joy and part of what the world needs? Verna Dozier also said, the church of God is all the people of God, lay and ordained, each order with its unique vocation, the lay order to be the people of God in the world, to witness by their choices and their values in the kingdoms of the world, in the systems of commerce and government, education and medicine, law and human relations, science and exploration, art and vision, to witness to all these worlds that there is another possibility for human life than the way of exploitation and domination. And the vocation of the ordained order is to serve the lay order, to refresh and restore 
the weary souls with the body and blood of Christ, to maintain those islands, the institutional church, where life is lived differently, but always in order that life may be lived differently everywhere. Let's start talking about calling and vocation all the time. One more about learn. If you said yes to number 18, please stand up. Please wave your hands. We are blessed to know or have known somebody over 100 years old. 100 years old. That's 10 decades. Thank you. The fastest growing generation around the world are the 85 plus year olds. Why? Because in general, healthcare has improved. In general, nutrition has improved. And people are living longer. That means that in many of our congregations and faith communities, you literally could have 10 decades represented in your membership and neighborhood. I tell students in my classes all the time, age is a social construction. Our ideas about what it's normal to do at certain ages are created by your culture, your context. In some cultures, it is normal for small children to follow their parents to work, to learn by apprenticeship the trades, the crafts of their tradition. In some villages in the Philippines, it is normal for young children as young as three and four to have versions of knives to help cut fish and prepare food. If your three-year-old in your house in most parts of the United States had a knife in her hand, somebody would call human services. <laughs> and for a right reason. We need, though, to recognize that all people of all ages are created in God's image. And all people are living texts from whom we can learn. The lives of each person is sac are sacred, and we need to learn to learn from one another. We need to get away from hierarchical age structures. For the love of God, please stop having all of your adult education be the adult forum. Adult forums are great experiences for people who want to gather on Sunday with a cup of coffee for a lovely introduction to a topic. I love them but they tend to be episodic drive-bys of the possibility of adult learning. One week we're talking about the book of Philippians. The next week we're talking about someone's trip to the Middle East. The next week we're talking about a new book that somebody wrote. And so it goes. They're episodic, they're inspirational, they're phenomenal. But who is an adult? An 18-year-old? A 27-year-old? A single mom who's 31 and working three jobs? A person who's 85 and isn't driving anymore but wants to be in fellowship at church? A person who's 92 and still traveling? Adult is a strange construction, and a one-size-fits-all adult forum is not enough learning for all of those beautiful people to engage with the holiness of what God is doing in their life. So please, please start to make your formation of adults broader than just the forum. Have it be how you greet each other in the coffee hour. Have it be how you write to each other when you send an email. Have it be other informal and formal ways that you gather around an intentional relationship in Jesus Christ. But honor elders, listen to their stories, and learn from one another. It is profound what God can do amongst us. Then there's the practice of pray dwelling intentionally with God every day. When I talk to people anywhere and I say, how's your prayer life? A lot of people get this kind of you know, scrunched up face look and it's like, mm, I wish you hadn't asked. I'm not very good at praying. I don't really know how to pray. And it makes me so sad because we've done a poor job of telling people how expansive prayer can be. There's not one way to pray. You don't have to know all the formal language of the Book of Common Prayer to know how to pray, but we have that beautiful book. You can certainly open it. There are so many prayers in that book that you may not even know are there, whole sections of prayers for special occasions, 
the colics that travel through the year. You can use that book to pray regularly, alone or with others. There's the daily office. There's the prayer for families, basically one page that gives you a little structured way to pray with your household. There's lots of good prayer there. But prayer can also be sitting in silence and noticing your breathing. Prayer can also be being able to listen to someone who has not had someone listen deeply before. Prayer can be what we do when we talk with each other about how God is speaking to us right here, right now. If you said yes to number three, please stand up. And prayer may be getting a speeding ticket. <laughs> Those of us who have had one or two or three or more speeding tickets, Tell me you haven't had a moment of calling on God as those lights <laughs> were spinning behind you and the officer walked up to your window and your heart is pounding. If your skin is darker than mine, your heart is really pounding. And we are praying in those moments for mercy. We are praying in those moments for forgiveness. We are praying all sorts of things that we may not even believe that's how God acts. But we are praying because we are wired to pray. Thank you. Number seven, if you said yes, please stand. Wave your arms. Number seven, yes. People standing and waving, you have been blessed to travel on a pilgrimage. You have been blessed to know prayer as the movement of the spirit taking your body to holy places with deep questions. You have been blessed with the opportunity to slow down and to notice and perhaps to be in intentional Christian communities where God is so palpable and real. That is prayer. The prayer of pilgrimage, the prayer of journeying to the heart of God. If you've ever walked a labyrinth I consider that a form of pilgrimage. If you've ever been able to cross borders, you are able to know something about journeying alone and with others to places where God goes before you. Thank you. Please sit. It is in the gift of knowing that we are loved and that we can experience those thin places as the Celts describe where God is so palpable, so present, that we can remember again what it means to pray, what it means to orient ourselves to a loving God. Hello, person in the door. No, come in. He's keeping us safe. Thank you. He's a security officer, and I think I just scared him. Um, <laughs> that's right. So when we pray, which we do alone and in community, informally and formally, beside our beds and with our children. It is God working through us to make new what is already before us. My family did not pray well together out loud. We were a classic Episcopal family. We were in church every Sunday, wherever we were, anywhere in the world. But to actually pray extemporaneously was kind of scary. We prayed pretty well for Easter dinner, Thanksgiving, Christmas, maybe birthdays. But that habit of just praying, I literally learned to pray aloud with my parents because I was part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in college. And they taught me to pray. They taught me about the Gospel of Mark. And I went home and I said to my parents, we can do this. And thank God I did because as my father lay dying in the hospital, he asked me to pray with him. He could never have done that if we hadn't practiced. I love that we practiced voting this morning. I love that we did that. Because next year when you're here and you're voting, that's going to feel familiar. That's what prayer is like. It takes practice. We have to build up muscles. Not be afraid. Try it. And then there's worship. 
we know kind of what worship is. It has a bulletin, right? It means going to church. It means, you know, music and up and down and maybe being an acolyte and maybe you are a lay minister and you read or you are a lay Eucharistic visitor. You take the Eucharist from worship to worship in people's private homes. Perhaps you worship informally at camp. Perhaps you worship at youth group. Perhaps you worship in your campus ministry. We know something instinctive about what it means to worship. We know that it means gathering in community somehow, but do we do it weekly? And is it always about praising God? Or do we sometimes kind of go because we have to, because we're signed up to do something, and we're kind of grumpy about it, and the football game's <laughs> going to start while we're still at church, and that's really on our mind? Let's get honest with ourselves about when we are fully present to worship and when we're not. We're human. We were reminded by the bishop, we are all saints and we are all sinners. And it is important for us to be honest that sometimes we're not fully embodied at worship. But the discipline and practice in the way of love of worship is one that to which we are all invited and expected to step into. We are invited to stretch in worship. One of the ways, if you feel like you regularly attend worship and it actually is somewhere where you are fully present, I would challenge you to explore is how do you move beyond the kind of worship you're familiar with? How do you move beyond the right Eucharist that you like so much and experience one that kind of mixes it up a little and, and you find the language a little foreign? How do we know that we are worshiping God? Is there just one right way or might there be messy ways like the diocesan convention that's spending a whole day and a half getting to Jesus? It's pretty awesome. If you said yes to number one, please stand. I am standing with you, and many of us who are standing or waving, we are people who were baptized as infants. Baptism is a remarkable experience of worship, right? Baptism is the place where we are made new in Christ at the font. And it is a form of worship that I mentioned to you last night can be transformative for people who do not know it. My goddaughter Jane watched us reaffirm our baptismal covenant, and it is that invitation that made her want to get closer. She remembered being sprinkled by the water as they brought, and they, the spurges came across. She got a splat on her forehead. She said, what's that? And we talked about the water from the font and what that meant as a symbol to us of renewal. Please sit down. A woman who was a professor of theology, Marianne Mix, at my own seminary, said, all who have been baptized by water and the Holy Spirit are called to ministry far beyond the walls of any church building. They are Christ's ambassadors to the world. They are agents of good. So she also said that most of us are looking for a God who is too small and too tame. What does this tell us about the power of baptism? The awesome dynamism of God the Spirit should lead us to ask questions with what kind of expectation and anticipation we prepare for baptism. So my question to us is, why do we prepare clergy traditionally for three years for ordination and many baptismal candidates for 30 minutes? If baptism is the thing that is going to change us forever, we need some serious preparation. And then the worship services around those experiences of being baptized will change us all. You can't prepare people in an immersive experience of congregation for baptism and have it not affect everybody. The life of a congregation will be made new every time you baptize someone if more people are involved in the preparation because we're waiting for that event to unfold. If you said yes to number 20, please stand. Okay, people standing, you're gonna have to get your big boy voice and big girl voice ready, okay? You are the people among us who have at some point imagined yourself as a superhero. I want to hear who some of those superheroes are. Shout them out. Let me go from this side of the room. 
Over here, a superhero or two. Wonder Woman. Who? Storm. Spider-Man. Superman. What was that one? Batwoman. Aquaman. Captain Marvel. Doctor Who. Over Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Spock. How about how about yourself as a baptized person? What if you're a superhero? Thank you. The I put superheroes under this area of worship because in my opinion it is essential that we as Christians live in this world convinced that we have superpowers. It is essential that we believe that the God we love and the God we follow in Jesus Christ can transform evil for good, can redeem all things, and that death has lost its sting. Resurrection is our theme song. We know that there is a life beyond the life that we live now. So we have to be superheroes. We have to forge our way against injustice. We have to be people who are crazy enough to believe we can fly and crazy enough to believe we can remove the barriers that are obstructing people's freedom. Imagination is critical to that. As C.S. Lewis said, Reason is the organ of truth, and imagination is the organ of meaning. We can be reasonable Episcopalians, and we can never get to the heart and soul of what it means to be fully human. We need imagination to do that. And I think being a superhero and being a person who can and will take risks for God is essential. It is vital, and it's fun. It is so cool. And I think as the bishop reminded us this morning, to be a superhero actually means claiming our own agency. It's claiming who God made us to be and using the gifts that we have been given because they are so extraordinary. If you said yes to number 12, please stand. We are the women and men and they in the room who are blessed to be part of extended families that are multiracial. This will increasingly be the experience of this country and the globe. We are people who have others in our extended family who do not look just like us, who may not speak our language as a first language. Thank you. I think this moves us into the two, two of the practices of the way of love. I think it is both to bless and to go when we come to know people well whose cultural and ethnic heritage is different from our own. We bless them with the witness of love and welcome, and they bless us with the witness of life stories very different from our own. We experienced that this morning as we welcomed a new community into your diocese whose histories are so different from most of ours. And yet, the blessing was in the room. You could feel it. But in that blessing, we are sent to go, to go cross boundaries, perhaps, and witness to others who have not yet experienced the blessing of diversity and tell them that that is good. It is so important that we know out of our own experience that God's love is a God, is a God, is love expo, ex, um, expressed in creation and the diverse ways that human beings live and move and have their being. Anybody who said yes to number 13, please stand. Sadly, we are those who have known or know people who have been directly impacted by the opioid crisis. I spoke with one deacon among you whose vocation is to work in addictions. Wherever are you now? I've lost you. There you are. There's somewhere. Um, the opioid crisis is killing this country. Please sit down. 
It is a place where we as church can be a blessing and we must act. It is estimated that 2.6 million people are addicted to opioids and as many as 200 die each day. It's an unfolding intersectional crisis. It is a desperate cry for redemption and healing. In 2017, opioids claimed the life of 2,033 people in Michigan. I couldn't find the number for New York, but I know that it was over 4,000. What number? 4,081. 4,081. That's about double the number of traffic fatalities in the same year. And by comparison, there were so many fewer in 10 years earlier than that. How is your congregation, your community, how are you responding to this reality? It may not be that you are directly involved in the front lines, but what are you doing to advocate for healthcare practices that do not continue this kind of abuse? What are you doing for treatment programs and to remove the stigma of shame for people who need help? What are you doing to pray, to support, to love and bless people who are human and made in the image of God whose lives have been devastated by this addiction or others? We can be a blessing of hope and resurrection by praying in the prayers of the people, by offering ourselves with our time and our treasure to support the kinds of ministries that are needed right where we are. Anyone who said yes to number 16? We need you. You tweet. <laughs> we really need you right now as a counter a, a antidote to some other tweeting that's been going on. Um, so here's the thing about tweeting. Um, any social media presence. It is vital that we show up in the world where people are. And in today's world, in the digital landscape that we live, all forms of social media are a place where people gather. They are a place where people can be found and can be seen. I talk a lot about our digital habitus. What are your spiritual practices online? And fundamentally, they should mirror your practices in person. Don't go online to launch about your boss. Don't go online to criticize your teacher. Don't go online to say things about your parents that you haven't said to their face. Go online to love God and neighbor. You can still be funny. You can still find fabulous memes. You can still pass on true and difficult information. But be who you are called to be and reach out to people who are lonely and hoping to find relationship in social media. It is vital, vital, vital that we love one another in truth online. When we know love, when we have been fed in Christian community, when we feel alive and awake and as if we are agents of the gifts that God has given us, we must go. The Great Commission sends us out into the world. And in the way of love, to go means crossing boundaries. It means going out and listening deeply, deeply to people and communities and issues that are probably on the margins of the worlds in which we live. We are called to go out and live like Jesus. Anybody who said no to number two, please stand. Folks, you've already gone. You have crossed a boundary and come into the Episcopal Church. These are people among us who did not grow up in the Episcopal Church. I agree that the phrase cradle of anything, cradle Episcopalian, is not ideal. But what I really want us to know is that the people standing and waving are people who chose this church. They have a story about crossing over. They know something about listening to the good news that they heard proclaimed through our tradition. May we not lose that gift. 
Anybody who said no to number nine, please stand. You are the few and the blessed who do not experience loneliness. And that is truly a gift. Please sit. The loneliness epidemic in America is real, and it is being written about, in fact, the loneliness epidemic across the world. One could argue that loneliness is, in fact, becoming one of the most serious public health risks of our time. Going back to someone, we, some of you may have read Robert Putnam when he wrote his book, Bowling Alone. He wrote it back in the 1990s. And he said that there were more bowlers in that decade than ever before, but there were fewer bowling leagues. This goes back to the disenchantment. People were disengaging from the institutions and the structures that had made meaning, but they were picking and choosing the activities that they could construct to make their lives have purpose. So they were no longer bowling together. He saw this bowling trend as emblematic of a destructive cultural shift in the broader society. And from centuries of America, where we had thick local relationships, where we really hung out with familial connections, where we knew something about breaking down individual, isolated individualism. He saw this collapse in both the secular and religious organizations. He worried then that Americans were developing habits to handle life in a hyper-connected world that were not going to help them, that were probably going to leave them more disconnected and more lonely than they ever had been. Fast forward, we now know that the functional MRI of the brain shows us that the emotional and chemical response to isolation or to rejection matches the trauma of physical harm to the body. One study that from 2008, so it's been around 10 years, demonstrates that one lonely day exacts roughly the same toll on the body as smoking a pack of cigarettes, and that positive social relationships are second only to genetics in predicting healthy longevity in human beings. So when you are alone, chronically lonely, your life expectancy diminishes. It's one of the reasons why, for the first time in the last few years, American life expectancies have started to drop. The British, the UK, have an appointed minister of loneliness. The EU has a minister of loneliness. The loneliness epidemic is more evidence, in my opinion, of our shallowness epidemic that I recognized last night. Christian formation, Christian discipleship, choosing a way of love happens in community. Being who we're called to be means being a body of Christ. That is an antidote to our times of anxious loneliness. If you said yes to number 10, please stand up. We are moving to the place of rest the place where we can receive the gift of God's grace, peace, and restoration. We have all spent the night, at least, at summer camp. <laughs> we know something about an immersive experience in Christian community or an intentional community that wants to notice everyone who is there. Thank you. At our best, when Christian camps are healthy, they can be a transformative, life-changing experience of Christian discipleship. They are Christian community gathered around the truth that is the love of God. They allow us to live out all of the practices of the way of love. Getting on the bus to camp is turning. Having to go to Compline at a campfire is an invitation to begin to pray and worship. Having program woven through your week at camp that likely talks about the Bible and teaches you stories of who Jesus was and who the prophets were and what it means to be a Christian. That's learning. Being in a cabin with people who smell funny and may not be your best friends and keep you awake at night and burp and snore and have stinky socks, 
That's a blessing. And you are blessing them by treating them well. And when we begin to listen to one another and to feel empowered and we feel like we know something about who we are and we get excited and we can't wait to go home and we can't wait to come back and experience it next year, we are going out into the world with good news. We are telling the embodied story of God changing our lives. So folks, you are people who have stories. You know a lot about what it means to walk the way of love. You already have practices in your life that are critical to being a Christian. You know what it means to turn. You know what it means to pray. You know what it means to learn. You know what it means to worship. You know what it means to bless. And you know what it means to go. I pray you know what it means to rest. One of the questions I asked you and we don't have time for is, do you have a hobby? Those can be great invitations to rest. Resting doesn't mean putting your head on the pillow and falling asleep. Rest means slowing down and focusing on something that takes you away from the busy and the anxious and the distracting. Something that delights you and gives you hope. Something that makes you feel whole and refreshed. So pay attention to those hobbies. Share them with other people. I want you to look on your desk, on your tables. There should be little way of love cards, those little blue pocket cards. And I want you to, now that you understand perhaps something about the way of love as we have adopted it as a church, to recognize it as those seven verbs of turn, learn, worship, pray, bless, go, rest. I want you to turn to your neighbor and talk for a couple of minutes about what of those practices comes easily for you and which practice perhaps is hardest. What do you need to go deeper in that practice that is hard? What comes easily and what do you need to go deeper? I'd like to invite you back. I hope I am leaving you with a sense that the way of love, a rule of life in your life and in your congregation's life, is a way back to enchantment. It's a way out of shallow and superficial faith. God is calling all of us to acknowledge that we cannot control the secularization of our society. We are called instead to create faith communities that are rich in narrative, rich in hope, places where dreams of justice and healing are talked about all the time. We are called to live out every day in the ordinary and messy ways that God calls us to be Christian. What is your rule of life going to be? How are you going to share it with others? How are you going to support others in their way of being Christian? How are you going to go deeper as a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple who has been made new in baptism? To close, I would like to read a poem to you by a poet who I just love, who I spent some time with just a week ago, Padrego Toma, who is a, an Irish poet. We are moving now into the prayers of the people. And I believe that in order for us to grow and to go deeper, the very things you might have just named as those areas of practice in which you need a little help are your petitions. They are your longing. They are your offering to God of what you would like help addressing. And this is a poem that Patrick wrote that I think is hopeful and helpful and life-affirming. 
as we each journey on in our way of love. The facts of life. That you were born and you will die. That you will sometimes love enough and sometimes not. That you will lie, if only to yourself. That you will get tired. That you will learn most from the situations you did not choose. That there will be some things that move you more than you say. That you will live and you must be loved. That you will avoid questions most urgently in need of your attention. That you began at the, as the fusion of a sperm and an egg of two people who were once strangers and may well still be. That life isn't fair. That life is sometimes good and sometimes even better than good. That life is often not so good. That life is real. And if you can survive it well, survive it well with love and art and meaning given where meaning is scarce that you will learn to live with regret, that you will learn to live with respect, that the structures that constrict you may not be permanently constricting, that you will probably be OK, that you must accept change before you die, but you will die anyway. So you might as well live, and you might as well love, you might as well love. You might as well love. <laughs>